Hi, everybody. My name is Alan. On behalf of the crew, I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Bridging Heaven and Earth. You know, I was just sitting here, and there's so much beauty happening around me. There's so much collaborative effort from the crew here, you know, who just have done, you know we've done this show for like 13 years now, and a lot of the people have been here for an extremely long amount of time in terms of doing the shows, and we don't do that many a year, so it really is a consistent effort. And th the amount of joy and creativity and collaboration that comes together when we do these shows is such a is such a gift nowadays. And all of us, I, I really can feel, and I can speak for the crew, and I can speak for all the guests who come on and come from long distances to be here. That it's just such an honor to to be part of something where where love is love is the question and love is the answer. Where this show, from the very beginning to this this moment, has always been about feeling love and sharing it about the true purpose of this life, the recognition of our of our oneness. I mean, if people have seen on every show at the opening credits, in a sense, and the closing credits, every flyer we do, every newsletter we send out, literally every email we send out in the name of Bridging Heaven and Earth is dedicated to the oneness. And what what is this oneness we speak of? What is this commitment that this extraordinary crew, this these magnificent guests who come in from all over, who travel, you know, get on plane and drive and fly back and just make extraordinary efforts to be here in terms of time, energy and money to share their love, to share their recognition of that oneness. And what is it? And, and how, as a human being, can we experience that in a, in a world of seeming turbulence and seeming turmoil and seeming meltdowns in, in so many of the systems that have been in operation for so long? And, and in our hearts, each of our hearts in every country on this glorious planet, every race, religion, every age group, every sexual preference, everything that we as humans consider differences or separations, every one of our hearts cries out to know that oneness, cries out to know God. And that's why there are so many different gods, because we're all searching for that universal truth, that unconditional love, God. The oneness, the, the creator, the, the love. Really, ultimately, it's the love. And how can we get there? And how can we answer the cry of our heart? And, you know, there isn't just one answer. Because there are a lot of different flowers and there are a lot of different paths. But the cry and the answer to that cry is here now. And if we can open our hearts as a species on this planet, we have an extraordinary opportunity right now, right here, right now, to know the oneness. And then everything will be different. The oneness is nothing to, is not to be afraid of. The oneness will not eliminate our separate identities. It will give us the fullness of who we are and the joyousness of having this separate identity in the vastness, in the oneness. So the cry is, the, the healing is, the healing of the heart is to know that oneness, to know that love, to embrace it. Embrace it. If you don't experience it, embrace it as a concept. If you don't experience it enough, pray in your heart, open your heart to experience it more. But we, we are here as human beings in this experiment on this planet Earth to know that what we on Bridging Heaven and Earth, what this extraordinary crew comes together to do is to be dedicated, to be committed to the oneness. And again, we have a guest who came in 
to be with you, to be with us, to be with this crew, to be collaborative in that effort, and to share his experience. Stephen Harefield is a spiritual teacher, he's an author. He's known as the American monk and American monk. He's had an extraordinary story. I mean, he went to war as a, as a, in the military for the United States and went to Vietnam. And the experience there, as I guess anybody could imagine, is as war is. It's horrific. I mean, if our intention is to kill and maim for whatever good reason, there is, a, there is something about it that is so destructive to the soul and so destructive to our connection to that oneness, to that love, that it just, it, it forced him to seek out that universal truth, to seek out some level of a peaceful recognition, a peaceful way to deal with the issues of this planet. And it led him to Zen monasteries in, in Vietnam, in South Vietnam, in India, Nepal, Tibet, and he adopted the life of a monk. And his hunger for that has just not, not lessened. It's increased to know that universal truth, to become one with that oneness, to share in that oneness, to come into a recognition and a realization of the fullness of, of his being, and to allow that energy, that manifestation, to just vibrate out of him, to be love in motion. And so, you know, we're very fortunate to have Stephen with us. And as most of you know, we also have music videos. Usually uh, we have videos of some kind, but most often we have music videos. And tonight we have one of Bridging's favorites, Kate Wolf, just an extraordinary being, an extraordinary talent who died too young of cancer. And she uh, had made this DVD and her, it was actually a VHS, it was a, a video, and her family has made it available to Bridging. We've shown some of the, the uh, cuts before, but we'll show it to you tonight. And also, as most of you know, we have, you know, we're in the middle of this unbelievable art project that came as a dream, it came as a vision, as a, as a healing for the planet, as a healing of the heart of the planet, as an acupuncture for the planet, to, to reach out, to say that we will be a vehicle for anybody who wants to participate to create a new original piece based on the theme Bridging Heaven and Earth. And we will have it on the shows, we'll have art project shows, we'll have this beautiful uh, Heaven to Earth art uh, virtual gallery on the internet where all these pieces are available and links to all the artists' website. And we'll be supportive of creativity and we'll be supportive of the creative process and, and the artists. and. And we have two extraordinary pieces that came in as part of that project. And we have over probably close to 200 now. And many, many others have committed to doing a piece and haven't manifested it yet. And tonight we have Cher Knapp and Jerry Felix's manifestation of that. So please join me in a meditation. Then we'll have the first Kate video and then we'll have Stephen. So please join me in a meditation. Hi, thank you. So this this is Kate Wolf. It's from a video, Kate Wolf, in uh, a concert in Austin. It was made in 1988, and that was the copyright on, on it. Uh, just beautiful. Kate is just a shining being. This first video is Give Yourself to Love. Fairly, fairly nice idea. Give Yourself to Love, Kate Wolf. Enjoy. Here's one you can sing with us. Give yourself to love if love is what you're after. Open up your hearts to the tears and laughter and give yourself to love, give yourself to love. Kind friends all gather round. Something I would say. What brings us together here has blessed us all today. Love has made 
the circle that holds us all inside. The strangers are as family. Loneliness can't hide. You must give yourself to love. If love is what you're after. Open up your heart to the tears and laughter and give yourself to love. Give yourself to love. I walk these mountains in the rain. I've learned to love the wind. Love is what you're after. Open up your hearts to the tears and laughter. And give yourself to love. Give yourself to love. Like the sea, and love can't give you everything, but it gives you what you need. And love comes when you are ready. Love comes when you're afraid. Will be your greatest teacher, the best friend you have made. So give yourself. Love is what you're after, and open up your hearts to tears and laughter, and give yourself to love. Give yourself to love. You must give yourself to love. Love is what you're after. Open up your heart. Self to love. Hi, everybody. Wasn't that a beautiful video? Kate Wolf, give yourself to love. Beautiful. And the, the incredible painting you're seeing in between Stephen and I. Is by Cher, uh, uh, yeah, Cher Knapp. Uh, she's a fusion artist. She's a good friend of Bridging. Love from the Goddess. It's an acrylic on canvas. Another unbelievable manifestation of Bridging Heaven and Earth from just somebody who wanted to share their love to collaborate with us. And, and you're all welcome to do that. So, so please do. Really, the more people who do it, the more the healing happens. So, Stephen, welcome. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. So at the opening, I said, you know, that you're called either I can't remember, the American book or an American book, but whatever it is, how would how would you define what it is to be a monk of any kind? Um, I'd say the uh, probably the simple answer would be uh, knowing yourself, knowing who you are, knowing that uh, in the mass of humanity, you're nothing more than a drop of water that falls off the wave and then back into the sea. But in doing that, you're still able to have recognition of just who you are. I would say that's the easiest way to look at being a monk. Um, just because you've stepped away from a monastery doesn't mean that's not who you are. Um, once you step away from the monastery, your monastery is your own physical form. And you just continue that path. So when you talk about being a drop in the ocean, I mean, 
when Jesus would say something like the Father and I are one, was he saying the ocean and I are one as well? You could say that, absolutely. Um, let's take that a little bit deeper if we can. Um, we as individuals have gotten so into the idea of separation and in watching your show and hearing your uh, monologue in the opening, we talk about the idea of oneness, uh, and I think that's really what Christ was talking about, how he had full recognition and, and full understanding of that unification. We talk about soul, we talk about light body, we talk about uh, energy forms, when we don't fully understand that it's all one. We're one people, we're one energy stream with different points of view. Something that totally fascinates me, uh, Alan, and science says that uh, in the history of the world, no two snowflakes have ever been alike. That's uncanny. I live in the Sierra Nevadas, and we can get 30 to 40 feet of snow in one year. Now, the, we know the world has been around for billions of years, and to never have two snowflakes alike. One of the things that maybe we as individuals have done is we don't realize that uh, we are the same as that snowflake. And when we look at 40 feet of snow, that's all oneness. There's no separation. There's no idea of separation. In fact, all of life is about oneness. And the only thing, the greatest thing in all of it, happens to be that human being. You know, I don't know if people have really considered this as a thought. We talk about the seven natural wonders of the world. We don't realize there's actually eight, and the greatest of all recognizes the other seven. And in all of that, it appears to be separation, but in reality, no, it's not. Because we, as that point of recognition of all of life, have the ability to recognize and realize the oneness. But what we've done through the idea of experience and conditioned experience is we've been taught that we're different. No, we're not. I mean, I see you over there and you see me over here, but we don't realize the connectedness in all of that. You and I internally are no different. Our minds are the same. We have the same ability for the same knowledge, the same level of understanding. The difference being is our individual experience, and that's all. So when Christ said, I and my Father are one, he just knew that as his experience. Any of us as humans, anywhere in this world, can do exactly the same thing. Why? It's self-acceptance. We've all been taught that we're broken. There's nothing in this world that's broken. There's nothing wrong out there. Everything is perfect. There's no good, there's no bad, none of it. All of those are notions and ideas of separation. And it could even be that there are ideas of ways for us to even learn, to understand and to comprehend ourselves. There may be the separation, understanding self. And I also mentioned at the opening that you had an interesting story because you know, you didn't start out with this same understanding of Father and I are one. It didn't, in essence, it wasn't a conscious understanding of yours, although you say you had the almost psychic experiences from an early age, but then you went through a process of study and being more, I would say, like rubbing up against the magnet. You rubbed up against the experience of you, you and the Father as one, and then it became more of a reality. Why don't you talk a little about that story and, you know, what were the, the lessons and what were the teachings that really allowed you more and more to rub up against that? Um, I think all of the lessons in life, and I, I had a wonderful pleasure of talking to quite a few of the guests in the audience um, uh, before the uh, show this evening. And it's interesting to me because everybody's journey in life takes them to one place ultimately. Uh, and that's the idea of consciousness, the idea of oneness, the idea of spirituality. Uh, in my own life, it was just, um, well, there's a Tibetan philosophy that says there are many paths, but there are one road. And in the Zen tradition, they say it's, it's not so much uh, the path, it is the journey itself. You see, in each moment that we're alive, we have an opportunity to have a lesson. As long as we look at it objectively, the truth is we're all born in that idea of oneness. And then the conditioning of life seems to move us away from that notion. And then the whole idea is kind of like uh, the sand mandala that the Tibetan monks do. They spend days and weeks making an intricate pattern in the sand of a variety of different colors. And then after all, they're all done with it, what they do is they lift that thing and toss it all into the wind. To me, the representation of that is the birth of oneness and then the separation of it and then the creation of the next mandala uh, gives us that understanding, the wholeness, the understanding of our own selves. 
And I think the greatest lesson that was ever gifted me was probably my dad. Uh, why do I pick that? Um, we were talking before we began the show. Um, five children. I was the middle child and seemed to be his favorite target because I could see things. And as you suggested, probably because he got frightened of that. Never considered that as an option until, by the way, you suggested that. But what I found through the years, <clears throat> even being in a monastery, is that he was the very one, the very dynamic, that put my feet on the path that walked. I realized that through all of that, there was no coincidence and no accident in any aspect of it. It all had purpose. Even when I was in the, uh, uh, Southeast Asia, I saw people that lived that shouldn't have. Um, guy got hit between the eyes one day and was standing there talking with us. Well, we're taught that you don't live if that happens. With a bullet. Yeah, absolutely. Um, he thought he was sweating. We didn't want to tell him. It. No. <laughs> wow. Um, because wow. he might have realized what happened. Another guy got hit in the hand and he gave up his life and really got curious about that. Why does that kind of a thing happen? Is life that fragile? Is life that real or is life that unreal? And as I began the pursuit of knowledge and uh, understanding myself and all of these paradigms, I realized that nobody is any different in any of that journey. It's just they experience different things. We can't avoid life. We can experience it. And as we step into the fullness of our own self and the idea of oneness, ladies and gentlemen, you can't imagine the magnificence of what life really is because there is that unification. There's just nothing but uh, uh, the experience and excitement of just being and being able to realize what it is that we're doing. Uh, the idea of realization, the idea of a mind can be a beautiful thing and comically enough, a dangerous thing. Because it's that mind, it's that ability to think, it's that ability to understand that yes, there was damage, but not really. There was just experience. I could be the saddest human in the world because of what my dad did to me as a child. I could be the saddest human in the world because of the experience in Vietnam. No, there's a choice in all of that. There's a choice in the reality of understanding the dynamics of the true nature of self. My heavens, everybody out there. There's no greater thing than that idea. There's no greater thing than realizing we're not separated from the Creator. So when the Christ said, I and my Father are one, there was a message there. It wasn't limited to just that individual. You could even say that Christ was unified with consciousness. Any of us and all of us are. All we have to do is allow ourselves that gracious experience of consciousness. And the key to that, as you represent so well, Alan, is the idea of unconditional nature, true acceptance of self, the idea of love, which starts with us as the individual, being able to experience that through our own being and then sharing that dynamic with all of life. That was my lessons, and that was the gift that my own dad gave me. That's the gift that each and any, each of us can experience on any given day and any given moment. That's life. And in essence, all these teachings that you went to and all these monasteries, in essence, were different, but they all led home. They all led to that experience. If they were, if they were righteous, if they were, the teachings were pure, would you say that would be accurate? Um, Master Kaila walked up to me one day and he said, young man. Every time he says that, I keep thinking Grasshopper. I, I love that show. So, <laughs> but he said that that's not his nickname. Tell me your nickname. Uh, it's beautiful. Which means? Peaceful Tiger. Peaceful Tiger. Okay, yeah, so. All right. But every time you say it that way, it just reminds me of that show, which I love. Go ahead. Um, we'd been talking during that day about uh, teacher and student. Uh, you know, when the student is ready, the teacher will come, that, that sort of idea. And what he said was actually surprising to me, and, and it's uh, something all of us should consider. He said, young man, we can teach you nothing. What we can do, no, I'm not going to hop around like grass. No, okay, you can forget no, that. Great, great, say, great, but, uh, great. He said that uh, we teach you nothing, but what we do is we give you the key that unlocks the door, but it's up to you to walk through it. And each door that you pass through within your own self, 
brings another level of knowledge. You see, when it comes to the idea of consciousness, uh, we limit ourselves in whatever aspect that we choose. In fact, the truth is we limit ourselves to what was yesterday. Um, yesterday is gone. When we operate in this moment today, this conversation only, to me, that's the only thing that's uh, in existence. That's where consciousness meets the human. And when we can live in each moment, who needs the teacher? Who needs the monastery? Who needs any instruction? Because it's all already there. So you see, when we have the keys, just because the door is unlocked, we still have to step into ourselves, into ourselves and not away from that. And as we do that, uh, we become more unified and are no longer the drop that falls from the wave. We find we are the body of consciousness. We are the creator of our own lives and our own reality. You see, I was taught and fully walked that path that we were made as equal as the creator itself. Now, that sounds pretty arrogant on the well, surface. the Father and I are one is very exactly. similar to that. That's so, exactly what it is. Right, exactly. Still working on answering that question. Right. No, you're doing great, yeah, Adam. But, no, it's an important <laughs> question. So what do yeah. I call you, Cricket? Call me whatever you like. Okay. But we actually had this joke of, well, but don't call me late for lunch. Actually, no, just don't, don't call me late. Right. <laughs> right. No, it's always on time. Right. Yeah. But that's how um, teachers in the East teach. It's always master to student. It's, but they don't teach. They show each and every human what they already know. In fact, when I do an intuitive session with a person, and I do them all over the world, uh, um, people say to me that what you've done is you've confirmed in essence what I already know. What does a teacher do? That's what they do. The trippy thing is, is how can any human teach another about life? How can any human teach another human about experience? I can assure the listening audience, no matter where you sit, that these feet have walked all over the world to look for the secrets to humankind. And I can assure you of one thing and one thing only. There are none. Never has been, they never will be. Because it's so simple, that's the secret. If there is a secret. Without hesitation, without question. I'd like to pose something to you, if I might. Oh. Let, let's say that you were this thing that we call the creator. You created all of this beautiful world, all of the magnificent energies that are on it. And you wanted them to come to the realization that they're exactly like you. That would mean you would have to hide that. Where would you do it? And how would you do it? You being the creator. You mean, how would I create this experiment if those are my intentions? No. How would you create the realization for what you created? The recognition? Mm -hmm. That you are my, that, that I, I am to be your equal. It would have to be within inside everybody. Okay. That's the truth. Right. You would make it so simple that the logical mind of the adult would never realize it. You'd also have to uh, put it in plain sight where it's going to defy logic and it's in plain sight, so it's perfectly hidden. It's the human. It is already us. And if there's one thing that anybody can get from me this evening, it would be that. The greatest key of being a human is the power that we wield. Not for the sake of power, for the sake of realization, simply of who we are. That rose can't be a petunia. A cat cannot be a dog, a giraffe cannot be an elephant, but a human. A human can be anything it chooses. A human can heal its own self. A human can heal anything, and it can destroy anything. And it just depends on what we choose to do with the power that we wield. We are the greatest gift to life of all things. We can do whatever we choose whatever and at any given moment we can grace the earth and we can heal the entire planet i once read in the dead sea scrolls that uh, to change the face of humankind it takes one only one and maybe that could be you it could be i it could be anyone walking down the street because all it takes is one moment for anyone to listen to themselves, to listen to themselves, and celebrate that idea of uniqueness. 
through that and then love the experience free of any level of condition which means one thing and one thing only how many humans out there can live life in complete acceptance and complete perfection unfolding from one moment to the next how many and if we can do that we have the world that we seek because it's already here Amen, brother. <laughs> oh, my beautiful. God. Now you're scaring me. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so, true, 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 true. So, what, you being the creator now, how did we develop this that humans would not only not recognize what's in plain sight, but bury it and, and pour separate it more out how how would that work how would that be created tell me how that would work and then tell me the path back to the recognition um in an amazing book um it was once written these words if the blind lead the blind then they will truly both fall in a ditch and what we've done is we followed a blind path by becoming external beings instead of the truth of who we really are. And why? Um, millennia ago, people wanted power. And the way to attain that power was creating the illusion of the external world and the significance of that world. We have forgotten only to a point that we aren't external creatures. We are internal. And beautifully enough, no matter what we see in this world today, we're being led back to where we originally were born and created. You see, the Garden of Eden has gone nowhere, but there have been many weeds planted. But what we're actually seeing is the harvesting of the weeds and the creation of a new dynamic called the divine human. Because we're realizing that all of these external powers have no grip. When we look at modern society, well, let's let's watch the second video, and then we'll come back to the divine human because I think that would be a really interesting thing for people to hear. Okay, so the second Kate Wolf video, another Kate Wolf concert in Austin, just so beautiful. Brother Warrior it is really wonderful. Settle in, listen, Brother Warrior, enjoy. This is a song about not losing heart. Gentle warrior With your heart like gold And a rainbow in your eyes Brave companion Do you see a world Shining in the sky With your body Dancing like an arrow Spreading joy Beneath your feet And your hands the wave like tall grass in the wind as you speak with the shyness of a small child and the wisdom of a sage I tell you now there is no reason to be afraid Brother warrior, there are none of us who walk this path alone. Spirit healer is the only life that we have ever known. And I see your smile in the sunlight. I hear your song in the rain. At this time when the earth is waking to the dawn of another age, I tell you now, there is no reason to be afraid. 
Welcome back. So, Brother Warrior, beautiful. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Kate's family. Just a beautiful video. It's concert in Austin. I think it's still available. It's probably in a DVD now. It's beautiful. So the picture you're seeing in between us that everybody in the audience seems to be really fond of, and it's you know it's a different representation of bridging heaven and earth than you know ones we normally see. It's Jerry Felix DIA. Jerry Felix DIA. It's an acrylic on canvas. It's just, you know, another magnificent manifestation of, of one of the flowers in this extraordinary garden. So, Jerry Felix, DIA. Okay, Stephen, so how do we un uncover, how do we come back into that recognition? Well, I believe the first thing that we have to do as individuals is recognize, one, that we're individuals. Let's look at a <clears throat> monastery. A person has to ask themselves a question. Why do monks dress alike and they all shave their heads? Well, that's absolutely an easy thing. They do it so they realize individual points of consciousness and the mass of consciousness, individual identities and in a mass of humankind. And what we must come to is you and I are not alike externally, but we are internally. And to accomplish the task, if we can call it a task, is a path of acceptance, allowing people simply to be who they are. One of the biggest, I used to humorously share with people that I believe that maybe the most difficult thing that we've ever been taught was uh, we can put on the shoulders of uh, uh, grammar teachers in school because they taught us about descriptive adjectives. To have a descriptive adjective, we have to have judgment first. And every great master throughout time has said, don't do that. Um, and if everybody uh, that views this and hears this Consider one thing, there's no such thing as a coincidence. There's no such thing as an accident. Everything happens with perfect fluid intention on any level of life. If that's true, you or I or no one has ever failed. You or I or no one has ever made a mistake. You and I and no one can never be white, right. <laughs> We can never be wrong. There's a Freudian. We're pretty white. I shouldn't go, I'll tell you. There's a Freudian. I'm pale and you might be close, so no. Okay, Moana. <laughs> uh, the point is, is those are things that have created the idea of judgment. Should we ever truly learn to return to the idea of oneness, then let's drop the idea of judgment because that's the thing that creates the illusion of separation. That's the illusion that creates the separation from the idea of the creator. We are all our own creator in this world. We've given ourselves the body. We've given ourselves the gift of experience. And yet when we come in here, we accept the conditioning as this is the way that it is. It's kind of like we're taught that God created this reality and then what? Oh, gross. What did I do? I'm out of here and went someplace else. No, it never did that. It's never left us. Even if we look at something that the Christ himself said, that in the uh, book of Luke, he says, you look here and you look there for the kingdom of heaven, yet you do not look within you. And if the, that kingdom is within you, and this thing that we call God is in heaven, where does that put it? We've even created the illusion that God's the man. 
love to refer to her as mom because I'd like to see a man give birth to a human. It can't be done, but a woman can. The truth is, is it's both energies. It is Adam, mind. It is Eve, emotion. In the idea of creation, the soul is first, body is last. The body is controlled by Adam and Eve, and we've allowed Adam to become dominant. You see, in ancient prophecy, um, Alan, it says that our society will go from patriarchal to matriarchal, which means she is returning. So when you ask, what can we do to get back there? I would say, enjoy your experience. Drop your judgment. Allow yourself to be fully you and experience everything that you can about you through an objective set of eyes, an objective mind, through the idea that there is no coincidence. And that leads you right down the path of acceptance. Life is simply what it is, just simply that. And the idea of judgment has moved us away from that. The idea of judgment has created the illusion of separation. The idea of judgment is what's created the weeds in the Garden of Eden, which has never gone anywhere. It's just what we've decided to do to it. And what we've decided to do to it is what each of us do to each other. You're my brother. The room is filled with brothers and sisters. And we don't see that. We think that because we have a wife or we have children, they're more important. Are they? Are they? How does one person have more importance or greater significance than another? If our creator creates only inequality, how can there be any separation? How can there be anything greater than simply being a human and allowing each of us to have our experience? So when you say, how do we get back there? Why not allow it to show up to us? And we don't have to go anywhere except to accept the gift that we all already are. That's the greatest gift of all. You, me, anyone listening, anywhere. That is the most significant thing of all. We already have it. So where are we going? You've already created the bridge. All we have to do is create the unification of heaven and earth. And that is inside of us. It's inside of each of us. You know, I could be the angriest human in the world. And the truth is, I actually am. That's why I was given the name Shanti Che. Because a tiger, that's kind of an oxymoron to think about a peaceful tiger. No. There's no violent tiger. You see, we can use any energy source to power us to any one direction without taking it out on each other. Besides, what is an argument ever solved? What is a disagreement ever proven? Nothing. Nothing at all. Other than you have your view and I have mine. You ever try to change another person's mind? Yeah, I do it all the time. <laughs> to, to no avail. Exactly. No exactly. Avail. So but I actually haven't quite learned that lesson, so let's okay. talk a little but, more okay, about but, it. But, but if, if we cannot change another person's mind, then why do we attempt? Go, tell me. <laughs> <laughs> we have this little three-letter word between our ears or somewhere, it's mystically, yeah, right. uh, that's called the ego. And it, it's interesting with people because you can watch them uh, if we observe objectively. Um, a person says a thing and another person goes, oh, i got to do better than that, and i got to do better than that. Where's the value in that? There is none. That's what creates the disagreement. You know, it's, so many people have said uh, the ego is dying. It can't be. We would be robots without it. It's just all in how we use it. The creative power that created a magnificent painting such as this had to come from that person's ego. The creative power of you doing your show and choosing the words that you do had to come from that same thing. It just depends on how we use it. So many teachers throughout the history of mankind have said that we are as a dual-edged sword. They're talking about that little three-letter word, which means it can swing either way. You ever want to harness it? There's the power and magnificence and the beauty of a human. I would have to say out of experience that uh, Christ probably had the largest ego that ever lived. Uh, of course, be a close second with the Buddha, Zoroaster, Zarathustra, and Dalai Lama. Oh, yeah. yeah, there were a lot of... Yeah, right. No, I understand. I was, I was wondering where I... No. 
<laughs> no, but, it is an interesting but concept. It's not something that we can read ourselves, but it is something that we can share. The thing that creates the danger is the illusion of the separation of self. That was created through and by the ego, through the conditioning that we've all experienced for centuries. We live unnaturally. Think about it. Square cars? Where's the aerodynamics in that? I know, I rented one. You should see it. It's like a cardboard box with wheels. It's kind of like, where's the aerodynamic? Where's the harmony with the universe in that? Where's the harmony in what we share with each other? Where's the harmony? Because I want to be better or less than you. Where is any of that? And how can there be anything better or less when everything was created in pure equality in the first place? The only thing that disrupts the idea of harmony is that thing between our ears. Why? Because my grammar teacher taught me adjectives which are useless. Because without judgment, we're magnificent people. And you step back into oneness. When you step back into oneness, the illusion of separation has gone away. The reason I ended up in India was because of uh, something my Zen teachers taught me while in Southeast Asia. They taught me to follow my urges. In my senior year, getting my bachelor's degree in psychology, I had an urge to go to India. My Zen teachers taught me to follow those urges because it's from inside you. Follow that. It's that subtle little guiding voice that says, go here, go here. The soul will only whisper to us. It will never shout but it will allow us to do whatever we think it is that we choose. This urge grew. It got stronger and stronger. I, you know what? I never hung around for my graduation because I knew it was going to happen. Sold everything I had, bought a pack, a sleeping bag, and that urge led me to New Delhi, India. And I began to notice a pattern, Alan, because when I got off that jet, I'd never been to India. I had no idea where I was going. No idea why I was even there, but I began to go north and basically west. And each evening I found myself, ironically enough, in a little village. And every village I entered into, I always got invited to stay with a family. Ate their food, got to know them. Next morning, I'd walk out the door with my pack on my back. There was always an elderly gentleman drew a, 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 with a stick or his finger a map for me to follow for the day. And at the end of each day, it was another village. The next morning was another gentleman, elderly. Found myself near the northern deserts of India, uh, called the Punjab. And I uh, was thirsty. Got a cup of tea, sat down under the shade of a tree. And from out of nowhere, the shock of my life, this voice said, we've been waiting for you. Now, I knew nobody knew I was there. I knew that. I kept drinking my tea. And the next thing I heard frightened me, actually, until I understood it. Because that same voice said, your name is Stephen, is it not? I looked around for Rod Serling, didn't see him. Yeah, and you had definitely crossed into the twilight, <laughs> so yeah, there was no question that you... I turned around and looked, and that's when I became grasshopper. Because behind me stood two monks. And they looked at me and said, six months ago, we began focusing on your energy. And we knew that you would be here on this day at this time. And we came to greet you. And they said, you are here to learn. So reasonable, reasonable mistook a real beating that kind of that during that period. Um, absolutely. Uh, every belief system I ever had and where I'm going is, is because I asked them, I didn't get a phone call. What do you mean you were calling me? Um, and that was my first lessons in consciousness. Wow. And for two days as we walked towards uh, what was going to be my next home for quite a few years, uh, I got lessons in consciousness and the idea of oneness and the idea of universal love. And that's how they got a hold of me. And that's how they tracked me. And that's how I know what I know today, is from that one simple experience of the idea of how connected we are. And to actually have it happen is a wild and mind-bending experience. You see, you and I talk, and we can do it without words. Some of the best conversations this individual has ever had is one without words. Just feel, just the experience of another human, which I share with my lovely bride every day, being able to do that in life.
in this thing that we call the mass of humanity. So how can we get back there, Alan? By realizing we've never left it. By accepting the fact that we're all perfect. There's nothing improper, incorrect, or broken or damaged anywhere. It's just separation of perceptions of humans and attempting to find one belief system that works for all people. Now, how can individuals believe in one belief system? Even if we look at the story of Buddha, um, <clears throat> could have been the wealthiest human in the then known world. Uh, went, nah, I don't want anything to do with that. Went with different groups, um, worked with different ascetics, um, different monastic teachings. And he walked away in absolute total frustration and thought to himself, they're all whacked. I, they didn't know that word. In that but I'm familiar with yeah. it. So, and I think the audience is fairly... <laughs> and he sat, under, out, sat down under the banyan tree and just let it all go. And that's when Buddha became Buddha. Because he let it all go. He let every belief he had go. And any of us can do that. Any of us. But this belief, after all, is not that important. What do you hold on to? What do any of you hold on to? Let me ask you something about that. I mean, you know, obviously that's that's correct and that's accurate in, in the context we're talking about it. But it, in some sense, it's, it's like just say no. You know, when, you know, Mrs. Reagan said just say no to drugs. But in essence, you have to say yes to something. So what, in essence, in your experience, can people say yes to, can they say yes to that rose, yes to their next breath? Why don't you talk a little bit, bit about that? How about yes to yourself? And, and tell, go through the process. Go through the process. It's, you know, um, get out of the future. Yeah, be here now, but... Well, no... Okay, go ahead. No, I asked the question that of... <laughs> because ultimately, here's the deal. Um, if you're gonna if you're gonna say yes to yourself, then the first thing that one has to do is if there's a have to, is step into the idea of self acceptance. We're all unique, Alan. I mean there's no question of that. And it's the celebration of that unique experience of you. You and I can look at those roses right now and I can promise everybody listening to this, we're both gonna see two different scenarios because we can only look at those roses through our own individual experience. Experience is what is brought us to where we are, brought on by what we can term very easily as what we know as the past. We aren't our history. Oh, we are, but only to an extent. If you remember your past, then you have, well, look at the word remember. What is that? Is that going back into the past and picking up lost body parts? Is that going back in the past and operating from there? That's not you. That is not you. Let's look at the idea of an alcoholic. Let's say you've known somebody for years that's an alcoholic, and then all of a sudden they disappear. And then you haven't seen them for years, and you're walking down the street one day, and you bump into them. What's the first memory that comes to mind about that person? Is that alcoholic? Yeah. <laughs> that's your past. Living in the moment the way I am. <laughs> yeah, I remember that last Right. Mark sure always was. Right. Yeah. Uh, and those are the ideas which is Stephen is attempting to pre uh, present to people, that that's what blocks people from now. That's hey, in 30 seconds, people. tell people what you want them to hear from your energy. Step into the truth of your own nature. All of us are seeking the idea of being empowered and having presence. The only way we can ever do that is by being present. Present means simply this, you can have your plans. But in planning, you may as well wait to go swimming in a dry ravine because they're both going to come out to be the same. What I mean by that, a plan is something towards the future. What you may not be doing is watching for the root or the stone that's in your path today in this moment. If you live in the future, you're missing your life. If you live in the past, you're also missing your life. Okay, we're coming to the end of the show. If you want any information, Stephen about the artist Alan, 805-687-2053, 805-687-2053. Good night, we love you, good night.